my grandparents' generation, they were all immigrants. And that's all they spoke was Judeo-Spanish, or Ladino it was called in popular times. Um, my grandparents always spoke to us only in Ladino, and we answered back in English. That was a typical American thing. My parents spoke to the older generation always in Ladino, and then to us always in English. We were supposed to be Americans. My middle name is Dwight. I was born July 1945. Eisenhower was a great hero, and we were Americans. My mother gave me a good American name, and that was part of the pattern of the Sephardic immigrants. The first generation were old country. My grandparents and all that generation was old country, and beautiful, happy, wonderful, sturdy people. Uh, they didn't come with much education, much formal education, and they didn't come with much money, but they were hardworking, honest, sturdy people. And if I had to be born all over again, that's exactly where I'd want to be born, among those people. The finest people I've ever met in my life. Good, solid people. And my parents, both of whom were born in Seattle, they only spoke Ladino until they went to public school. At home, that was a language. They learned English in school. And my mother used to say, it's as though I'm an immigrant myself, even though she was American born. She was only a woman, so by the time she was 16, she had to quit school to go to work to help support the family. Um, they didn't think girls needed much education. My mother was brilliant, the most well-read person. She read everything, and that was a great inspiration to me. And my dad owned a grocery store. In that generation, there were the transition from um, Turkey and Rhodes to becoming American. It's a very interesting sociological phenomenon. In that generation, these people worked very, very hard, and they wanted their kids to be successful. Almost all the kids of my generation went to college, became uh, doctors and lawyers and professors and financiers and real estate tycoons and whatever it is. But in three generations, uh, they came from poverty-stricken immigrants to good old-fashioned middle-class Americans um, in, in the positive sense of those words. When I was little, I grew up in the central district of Seattle. Almost all the Jews lived in the central district. And walking through the neighborhood, we knew it was a Jewish neighborhood because we always heard Spanish in the streets. The old timers, that's what they spoke. And um, it was a beautiful thing. Uh, when we, we spent much of our time as in my childhood with my grandparents, my maternal grandparents, Marco and Sultana Romi. My grandfather's, my um, paternal grandparents died before I was born. I didn't know them. But we spent much time with my grandparents, Romi's house. And um, everything there was in Ladino. So we had Haggadah. So we would go around the table, but all the older men would always sing their parts in, in Ladino. And the kids would say in Hebrew, English, whatever we knew, but I want to sing one section of the, of the uh, Halachmania, which we always sang in, uh, when I edited the Haggadah of my own, I made sure we included it in it. Okay, I'll sing you a little bit. Este el pan de la frisión que comieron nuestros padres en tierra de Ayifto. Todo el que tiene hambre venga y coma. Todo el que tiene de menester venga y pasque. Este año aquí, el año el vinien en tierra de Israel. Este año aquí, siervos, el año el vinien en tierra de Israel y sus foros. So every year when we sing it, and our kids sing it, our grandkids sing it. They don't know the Ladino at all anymore, but that generation is all gone. But we sing it. And um, my wife was Ashkenazic, she sings it better than the rest of us. Um, but uh, when I sing it, I hear my grandparents' voice. It's, it's very nostalgic, very deep, very beautiful. In our synagogues, both the uh, Turkish and Rhodes synagogue, some of the prayers were sung in Ladino. And there's a certain flavor to the language which you can't buy and you can't convey. It's something very emotional, very nostalgic. So for those of us of my generation who grew up hearing those things, when we hear those language, even if we don't understand all of the words, we understand a civilization. It was our parents or our grandparents, uncles and aunts. It was very profound. By the time of my grandchildren's generation, it doesn't mean anything anymore. It's, they're far, far removed from it. So I think I'm just about the last generation, my generation is about the last generation, certainly in the United States, of Jews who heard the language spoken as a mother tongue. It's, now it's, uh, you know, with some ritual songs, uh, we still sing a few songs here and there. We sing Mercado Mazzon in Ladino. There are a few things that we do in Ladino, but it's nostalgic. But to have heard people speak it as their normal, natural mother tongue, 
that pretty much is uh, we're, at the end of, we're the end of the era. In the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue in my day, we had a wonderful mixture of Sephardic and Ashkenazic members, and it was not an ethnic synagogue. But because it wasn't ethnic, it was really very interesting. We had Ashkenazim of all stripes and Sephardim of all stripes, including a very significant number of Sephardic Jews from the island of Rhodes, from Salonika, from Izmir, uh, from various parts of Turkey, from Bulgaria. And after services on Shabbat, um, certainly among the old timers, when you went to Kiddush, you heard French and Ladino and English and Hebrew and all kinds of languages. It was really a polyglot congregation in those days, which was very special. Um, and we did try, because my own kishkas, as you use an Ishkenazic word, are Sephardic, I wanted to really bring a Sephardic element to everything that I did. So we did have Ladino classes. Uh, we put on some plays in Ladino. We had a, a blessed memory, Professor David Altebe. He used to be not, not only a fluent speaker of the language, but he was a good dr dramatic dramatist. And he put on plays. He wrote plays and we put them on. It was very, very nice. And we had lots of people attending. It was very, very good. I, in, the, in the 1970s, I started an organization at base of the synagogue called Sephardic House. Now it's merged with the American Sephardi Federation. But the, per, the point was to make the broader community know more about the Sephardic experience. I don't think of uh, the Sephardic world as being a fossil. I can't stand when people say, we have to preserve our heritage. Pres you have to preserve fish. You don't preserve a civilization. Civilization lives. And a civilization changes. It's inevitable. So the idea is, what can we take what were the best values, the best ideas, the best teachings that we had in our tradition that are relevant not just for us and our children and grandchildren, but relevant for all Jews? And if I could even be so bold, relevant for all human beings, whether they're Jewish or not. And that's the vision that has kind of dominated my life. When I came to New York, I was at Yeshiva University, and there were very, very few Sephardic students in those days, very few of us. And they had a Sephardic program, and the teacher the main teacher then was Chacham Solomon Gaon, who was my main teacher, and actually he's really the reason I became a rabbi. It wasn't my original intention, but things, things happened that way. So we had a small group of people, but I discovered very early um, that there were some Sephardic intellectuals of Turkish background, and I have this affinity for them. Just a natural <laughs> blood affinity. They weren't blood relations, but I felt something. And one of the people that was a very profound had a very profound influence on me was Professor Mayor Jose Benardete. Benardete was eccentric. He was a curmudgeon. He was a professor many years at Brooklyn College. He was a Turkish Jew from Chanakala. He was the first Turkish Jew who became, uh, I think he got a PhD. He was the first, I think, of PhD in America. And he was the first one to teach in university. He taught Spanish for many years at Brooklyn College. And I first met uh, Benardete, I think, 1970. I just started at Sheriff Israel in 1969. And Bernardetta gave a lecture in which he was very, very critical of the ignorance of people, the ignorance of students, and the ignorance of every, he, he called everybody names. So after his lecture, I went to him and I said, Professor Bernardetta, you're entirely right. I'm totally ignorant. Now you have to teach us. So he just walked away in a huff. OK. Two days later, I got an inscribed copy of a book that he wrote me to Rabbi Mark Angel, one of the great leaders of our people. He was very, very effusive. Um, you understood my challenge, come to my house. I called him up, I went to his house. We became, he became like a surrogate grandfather to me. And he was a very profound man, a visionary. And, but he was so, so cantankerous, it was very few people could put up with him. He was, he, had a, he was a stubborn guy. But he had this tremendous love of Spain, of Spanish, and his book, it was, it was called Hispanic Culture and Character of the Sephardic Jews. Um, it's an interesting book. It's, uh, by modern scholarly standards, it's probably not the top of the, lo of the line. But from the point of view of a person who himself comes from a Sephardic background, it opened up tremendous vistas to me. And he had a circle of friends that used to come. There was David Barocas, Louis Levy, all of blessed memory. And there's a circle of older Sephardic Jews. We used to gather in Benardete's house from time to time. And I was a youngster in those days. Uh, but there was a commonality. There was an idea that Sephardic culture often is portrayed as a folk culture, or the, uh, which it is. We have a very rich folk culture. But when people think of Sephardim, they think about our food and our songs and our folk traditions. But they don't 
think enough that we also have brains, that there was an intellectual heritage, that there were thinking, that these, there were values. Behind all these customs, there are values. And that's what attracted me to this group of people. These were really super intellectuals and people who cared about ideas. And so this meant a lot to me. In the early 1970s, I wrote an article for the American Jewish Yearbook on the Sephardim of the United States. I think that was the first serious study about the Sephardim of the United States. And primarily I dealt with Judeo-Spanish communities. And I did a survey, it was a sociological study. And all. In the course of my research, I was at the New York Public Library Jewish Division, which is one of the best places to do research in Jewish studies, it's phenomenal. And I came across microfilms of a newspaper called La America. It was a newspaper that was published in New York from 1910 to 1924 by a man named Moïse Gadol. I call him Moshe Gadol. Moïse Gadol, he called himself. I started reading. I still am fluent enough in the language, certainly in those days, to be able to read the newspaper without trouble. And I thought, this, this is a genius. This is a, this is a, this, I can't believe it that, that we had this here. I had no, no idea. Uh, uh, perceptive writer, creative, imaginative. He published poetry, he published essays, he published challenging things. It was a newspaper that was alive. It came out every single week. I thought, wow, we had this. I didn't even know that. So then, after I finished the article for the American Jewish Yearbook, I got all of the microfilms from, from beginning to end, and I spent, in those days, now we have better techniques, but in those days I had microfilms. Every day, I would spend a couple hours a day reading from the beginning to the end. And I took, and it ended up being my book, La America, The Sephardic Experience in the United States, which I think, I, it was, I think it was the first serious study about the Sephardim in the United States, certainly of the Judeo-Spanish Sephardim. And um, I was trying to want to figure out at one point, why am I so interested in this fellow? Because he was a New York person, I'm a Seattle person, but it was the same civilization. At the end, in the 1924 period, it was his, the newspaper was losing um, subscriptions. He, he was, there was a lot of competition. Other newspapers uh, came to the fore. La Vara became more popular. So poor Moïse Gadol, he's trying to build up his subscription base. So he started printing the names of subscribers. And lo and behold, I mean, the list of subscribers in the 1920, I think it's 24 issues, one of the issues in 1924, from Seattle, Washington, Marco Romi, my grandfather. Oh, I now understand. My grandfather put me, brought me to this newspaper. So my grandfather was one of the supporters of this really great man. So there's a lot of stories there. And I think the, the stories of the Judeo-Spanish Sephardim in the United States is a success story slash not success story. Success story is that by my generation and certainly the next generation, we're Americans. We're successful financially, economically, educationally. That's very plus. The minus is we're so spread out. There's been a high rate of intermarriage out of the faith diminishing of Jewish observance. Those who have become observant become more extremely observant. But the old Sephardic vision of inclusiveness and love and happiness, that's diminishing somewhat. Um, when I was a kid, I always thought that being Jewish was the most fun thing in the world. I didn't know there was a problem being Jewish. Everything was a party. Our, our people love to sing, they love to eat, they love to have fun fragrances, colors, everything was fun. Um, when we used to have Shabbat lunch, it was, we didn't call them Shabbat lunch, we called them Shabbat parties. When our, we used to go to Seattle every summer with our kids, and the, we'd be in my parents' house, and my kids, they, they learned Shabbat is really, how could you possibly give this up? It's such a wonderful, happy time. Relatives come in, relatives visit, friends visit, uh, in and out of the house all day long. It's hard on the women. My mother was a great cook, and she cooked tons of food, and it all went. <laughs> we, all, we all loved it, and she loved it. We all had a wonderful time. Um, but it was a very happy religion. Even, uh, we used to have what was the Ashkenazim called your site. So we call them Mildados. What's a Mildado? On the anniversary of the death of a loved one, um, one of the children would have a gathering in their home. Now they do it more or less in the synagogues. But in the old days, these were always done at home. And the hostess would always cook a storm, cook about lots of food. Uh, you know, uh, sweet rolls and hard-boiled eggs and raisins and raki and uh, sliced tomatoes, Greek olives, cheese, light stuff. And 
the house would fill up, and the rabbi would give a little drasha, a little talk, and people would talk. And if you didn't know it was a memorial service, you would think it was a party. Everyone was happy, talking, and when you talked about the person who died, it was in a happy tone. Very remin you know, you reminisce all the happy times we had together. But it wasn't morose at all. I, when I came to New York, it was the first time I, this is my famous joke, it's partially true. I said, I didn't know there were neurotic Jews until I came to New York. Uh, in New York, there's a different intensity. Even among the Sephardim, there was a different intensity. In Seattle, it was manana, take it easy, life is good, we'll have a good time, relax. And it's beautiful, the scenery is beautiful, take your time to look. Beautiful Lake Washington, beautiful Mount Rainier, take your time. The Sephardim in Seattle actually had an advantage to the ones in New York. In New York, the immigrants, they lived on the Lower East Side at the beginning. Tenements, slums, hard. And there were so many of them. And in La America, he tells many stories of the Sephardim who came to America and to New York. And the Ashkenazim, who had, were the establishment then, they didn't recognize them as being Jews. My grandfather in Seattle told the same thing. That when the first Sephardic bastards got to Seattle in the early 1900s, they went to the Ashkenazic synagogue. And the Ashkenazim spoke Yiddish, and the Sephardim spoke Spanish. It was, they didn't understand each other. So then, uh, what are your names? al Khadef, Angel, Paul Ikar. Those don't sound like Jewish names. OK, so they took out their tefillin. And they thought that they stole them from some Arabs or something. They didn't know, they didn't believe that they could be Jews. So there's a letter, actually, that was sent to Dr. Henry Pereira Mendes, who was a rabbi at Sheriff Israel in those days. And Dr. Mendes sent the letter back to Seattle. And says, these are Jews. They're Sephardic Jews. Accept them. Let's bring them into the community. So there's a lot of misunderstanding uh, between the Ashkenazim and Sephardim. So Moshe Gadol describes when Sephardim came and they got off the boats. So there used to be an organization called Hayas. It still exists, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. And they'd have workers at the ports to, to help the immigrants. But all the people they looked for were Yiddish speakers. They, if they saw someone who looked darker skinned or looked a little didn't look like, didn't know Yiddish, they assume they're not Jews. They assume they're Italians or Greeks or Turks, whatever they are. And they didn't help them. So Moise Gadol established an office in the highest to help the Sephardic Jews. And uh, it was a hard, hard ride for them. But they were spunky, they worked hard, they had a dire, desire to live. I asked my grandparents, so why did you leave the old country? You know, because they talked very nostalgically. Uh, it's nostalgic, but immense poverty in the old world no opportunities for women. Educational level was very minimal. The chance for growth was small. And the dream of America was very big. So parent, my grandmother, may she rest in peace, Sultana Polikar Romi, I asked her, we called her Nona. Nona, why did you leave your parents in Shikif, the island of Marmara? You left Marmara. All of her sisters and brothers, they all came to, to Seattle, actually, Seattle and Portland, Oregon. She said, when I left my parents, I knew I would never see them again. But my parents said, you have no future here. You go to America, you'll get married, you'll have a family, you'll, you'll make a life. And all of her sisters and the brothers came to America, and they all did fine. But they had to leave the, the, the um, old world. There's a lot of tragedy, a lot of sadness in those stories. But they sacrificed so much for the next generations. Well, it was definitely true in New York, and, but it was also true to a lesser extent in, in places like Seattle or Atlanta, wherever Sephardim settled, is the masses of people were hardworking people. These were not people that were, uh, had the leisure to, to uh, have uh, you know, great intellectual ad adventures. They were people who were struggling to make a living. They all had six kids, seven kids, eight kids, uh, and they had to work. Having said that, <laughs> We had not only La America, but there were, there were probably uh, maybe even up to a dozen Latino newspapers over the course of the years, La Vara being the biggest one, I believe. Uh, and they were, these were lively journals. And they attracted the younger intellectuals to write. And, and there, there were people like that who were, who were writing, Benardotte being one of them, but not the only one. There were others as well. And what all, we also had was a Sephardic theater. They were, these theaters, very often the plays were uh, translations from French plays or from other kinds of plays, but often enough they were also by you know, homegrown talent, homegrown Sephardim um, who wrote plays. So there was, a, there was a cultural life that was able to uh, hit the imagination and the spirit of the people. Also what happened in the early 1900s, 
Spain became more interested in Sephardim. There was a senator, Angel Pulido, who uh, was taking a trip in the Mediterranean somewhere or other, and he was on a boat, and he hears two people speaking in uh, Ladino, and he listens, he says, it sounds like Spanish, and he's a Spaniard, he goes, he listens, he says, I understand, but there's a strange language, I'm talking to them, he realizes that they're Sephardim, unbelievable. So he wrote a book called Española sin Patria, Spaniards without a country. And he tried to reclaim the Spanish connection with Sephardim. So there were a number of Sephardim in New York and elsewhere who were enchanted with the idea of reconnecting with Spain. I don't think my grandparents who spoke Spanish realized it ever came from Spain. They came from Turkey. Uh, they don't have any particular feeling for Spain. Uh, but the next generation, because of the, the Spanish uh, influence, um, they, they started feeling a connection to Spain. Even though the Spaniards weren't so good to us in the Middle Ages, still there was something, something romantic about the idea that they're reclaiming us as part of them after all these centuries of exile. So there were Sephardic intellectuals who did collections of proverbs, collections of the old folklore, um, the folk songs, the Ladino romanzas. So that also became a whole new cultural experience within the Sephardic world. So we had a lot of intellectual ferment. On the religious side, we had some, some uh, religious leaders who were outstanding. Most, I won't say, shouldn't comment on people's, it's hard to be a religious leader, I can tell you from personal experience. Um, but the leadership wasn't outstanding. Um, one of the great leaders of Sephardic Jewry in the um, 20th century was my heroes, David de Solopool. He was my predecessor when, when I came to Sheriff Israel in 1969, I sat next to Dr. DeSola Pool in the reader's desk where the rabbis sit. And he died in 1970. I had one year overlap with him. Um, but here was a man who was English, very, very, he was probably the most famous Sephardic rabbi of Sephardic, Sephardic Jew of his time, a man of great culture, great intellect, who felt a deep affinity for the Sephardic immigrants. When the Sephardic immigrants first started coming in, they spoke Ladino, they were poor, they were living on the Lower East Side. And Sherith Israel, a very fancy synagogue, we've been here for hundreds of years, founded from 1654, all elegant Jews. Uh, even the Sephardim were very assimilated, uh, Americanized Sephardim. There were no real Spanish speakers anymore there. And the half the congregation was, at least half was Ashkenazic. But Dr. Poole, and got the sisterhood in particular, to be involved in reaching out to the Sephardic immigrants. And the sisterhood actually bought settlement houses on the Lower East Side. They ran a couple settlement houses where they had classes in English, employment offices, Talmud Torah for kids, a synagogue, at their expense of the share at Israel. Um, we gave a section of our cemetery for, for burial uh, for, for, Sephardi, for Sephardic immigrants who didn't have their own uh, burial places as yet. So the synagogue really tried very hard. There was a cultural um, dissonance between Sheriff Israel, which was very American, and the immigrants. You had it among the German Jews and the immigrant Eastern European Jews. You had the same kind of difference. But the Sephardic Jews from downtown eventually, when they got more affluent, moved uptown, and they became very active members of the synagogue. And uh, they, they turned out to be fine. When they first hired me in 1969, I, I was the first rabbi of Turkish or Judeo-Spanish background actually to serve at Sheriff Israel. So some of the old timers, they used to say, oh, you're an Oriental Jew. That's with old fashioned prejudice. I said, no, no, I'm, I'm actually American Jew from New York, from, from I was born in Seattle, and my grandparents came from Turkey. But there was a feeling that the immigrants were Oriental Jews, and we're Spanish and Portuguese, somehow it's something better. Uh, so you had the same thing among Ashkenazi between the Germans and the Eastern Europeans. But they got used to me, I got used to them. And um, I, I had a wonderful, uh, wonderful tenure at Sheriff Israel, and I'm grateful to God uh, for having been blessed to be rabbi there for almost 40 years. Uh, Dr. Poole realized that there were you know, 35, 40,000 Sephardic immigrants coming into New York. And our synagogue in the early 1900s, Sheriff Israel, was maybe 80% Ashkenazic membership wise. So Dr. Poole said, oh boy, new Sephardim are coming in. These are natural um, new members of the congregation. Let's bring new life to the congregation. The old timers in the synagogue weren't so keen on that idea. They didn't want all these poor immigrants coming in. But Dr. Poole 
as I said, uh, established, got the sisterhood involved in establishing settlement houses. One of the things that Dr. Poole did was he wanted to establish a unified Sephardic prayer book for America. So because in the old days, everyone came with a prayer book from, from Turkey or from Rhodes or from wherever they came from, from Syria. Every synagogue had five different prayer books. And none of them are very good. And none of them had very English, good English translations. So Dr. Poole started going back into the 1920s. He, in, he established in 1928 or 29 the Union of Sephardic Congregations, whose entire purpose in those days was to publish prayer books that he translated and edited. And the prayer books were beautiful. They were presented nicely. And they were sold at next to nothing. They were sold at very, very small price, almost at cost. Um, so the congregation should all have books. So for Dr. Poole's dream was all Sephardic synagogues in the United States should have one prayer book, one unified prayer book. Well, it was a brilliant idea. And it somewhat worked, but it didn't really work. Why? Because each Sephardic community has its own custom. It's not, they, don't, they aren't Spanish and Portuguese. The Spanish and Portuguese custom is very pristine and very non-Kabbalistic. And everything Kabbalistic, Dr. Poole leaves out. All the Western Sephardic tradition is not Kabbalistic. The, the Eastern Sephardic, so-called Eastern Sephardic, Mediterranean Sephardic Jews, Kabbalah was part of the game. So when, after the first edition came out, the guy said, we can't use this book. You, don't, you, you didn't include this, you didn't include that, you didn't include that. So the second edition, Dr. Poole started including stuff. And he said, some congregations say, some, 99% say, only we didn't say. But if you look at Dr. Poole's book, he, whenever he says some congregations say, it means all other Sephardic synagogues. Sherat Israel's custom is in the United States, only one that would follow this is Sherat Israel and, and Mikvah Israel in Philadelphia. That's it. But everybody else doesn't follow this custom. So the community, the Syrian Jews always had their own. They never followed Dr. Poole's book. In Seattle, they publish their own book now with uh, Rhodes and Turkish customs. And there are other books available from Israel. So there's, there's a lot more things available. So Dr. Poole's dream of a united prayer book for Sephardic synagogues never, never materialized. So the, the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue had the aura of being this grand, historic, magnificent synagogue. When I was a little boy growing up in Seattle, our prayer books were the books that Dr. Poole um, prepared. So his name was in every book. When I first came to New York in, in 1963 as, as a freshman in Yeshiva College, so I arranged to spend a Shabbat at Sherath Israel. I had no idea that I'd ultimately end up there. And I met Dr. Poole, like meeting a movie star. I was just overwhelmed at the honor of meeting such a great man that I would ever sit next to him on the same reader's desk. This was a glorious dream I never could have imagined. It was a very great privilege in my life. So the, the Sephardic world always had a, a great pride and a reverence for the synagogue, but it didn't necessarily reach into their bones. What I mean is it, Sherat it, Israel was really different. It's not a Spanish, it's not a Sephardic synagogue in the classic sense. Our music at Sherat Israel is very westernized. We have a choir. It's very alien to the Turkish Jews and, and Syrian Jews and, and Rhodes Jews. They're not used to that kind of thing. It's very different. So those who came, they learned it and they loved it. It's beautiful. I loved it. I, no, no complaints. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous custom. But the most, it's not the same at all as the um, melodies and traditions that I grew up with in Seattle or that Sephardim grew up with in general. But let me give one example of the culture shock I had when I came to New York. When I grew up in Seattle, I was used to the Turkish Minhag, the island of Rhodes and Turkish Minhag are pretty much the same musically. They sound pretty much the same. So one Shabbat I came to a friend's house for a Shabbat, a Shkenazic friend in Borough Park. And it was that Shabbat and they were doing, it was a Shabbat that they announced Rosh Chodesh. So they had a chazan, or I should say a chazan, a very beautiful voice. And the chazan was singing the prayer for the new month. And, the son, and he sings, um, Chayim shel shalom, Chayim shel tovo, Chayim shel brocho. And he's crying his brains out. What is he saying? God, give us a life of happiness, of peace, of blessing. And he's crying. In Seattle, when I grew up, on Yom Kippur, we sing, Hatanu lefanecha, rachem aleinu. God, we've sinned before you. Have mercy on us. How do we sing it? Hatanu lefanecha, rachem aleinu. It's like a hoot nanny. Everyone sings, having a great time. Ooh, it's fun. Fun. We're saying, God, we've sinned before you. Have mercy on us. And we're singing as though it's a, we're having a party. This guy's singing about happiness and blessing, and he's crying. And we're singing about sins, and we're happy. Oh, there's a very profound thing in it. 
in a Sephardic mentality, God actually loves us. God isn't an old man with a stick waiting for us to make a mistake so he can zap us. God isn't there to punish us. God wants us to live happy lives. Whoa, that's a very important message. It's an important idea. God loves us. God will forgive us. God isn't a nasty fellow that's trying to, trying to hurt us. When you grow up with a religion that's sweet and that's kind and that's gentle, it's, it's very, very appealing. It's very, it holds your, holds your soul. Doesn't mean all Sephardim kept it. So for, we have plenty of assimilation, plenty of people moved away from the tradition. But for those of us who kept the tradition, I, I don't know how anyone could give it up. It's just too valuable. It's too precious. I think we live in a post-ethnic Jewish world. Not quite there yet, but a generation down, it's going to be post-ethnic. It's not going to matter to our grandchildren if they're Sephardic or Ashkenazic or anything, because they're going to be marrying each other. There already is a vast amount of, of intergroup marriage. We live in a different culture. The, we don't live in closed uh, uh, communities like we did in Turkey or Rhodes or wherever else, or Aleppo. Or, those things don't, don't exist. We live in a much more open society. So the, the boundary lines that, be, that separate one ethnic group from another are, gonna, are blurring already. And another, let's say two generations, they won't be relevant. Uh, so what, what is relevant? Why, why is Sephardic important to me? Sephardic is important because all of Jewish history and all Jewish civilization is important. For me to be a thoughtful, intelligent Jew, I have to know about Hasidism. I have to know about the Gaon of Vilna. I have to know about the Shalom Aleichem and the Yiddish writers. To be a full Jew, there's, there's a whole... Ter but I also have to know about the Jews in Morocco, and the Jews in Turkey, and the Jews in Syria, and the Jews in Afghanistan. All that wonderful variety belongs to all of us. It doesn't matter if I'm ethnically connected to them. There's a, there's a vast civilization that has something to say to all thinking Jews, all thinking human beings, really, but certainly to all thinking Jews. That belongs to all of us. I want my kids, my grandkids, to feel comfortable with everything, not to be narrow. So that's what I think is going to happen. What's my problem? My problem is reality. <laughs> reality is not so, not so, uh, not so comfortable as my, my vision. Reality contradicts me. There's an increasing tribalism among Sephardim. A more greater desire to be ethnic, certainly in Israel that's so, uh, and it's here to all. It's true in the United States as well, where the idea of, of expansiveness and sharing is is more complicated. Cult culturally, there's more of an attempt. To, I, I'm a I'm a Syrian Jew. I'm a, a Turkish Jew. I'm a Greek Jew. I'm a, but everyone's fighting more for their own tradition. Why? Because they feel it's slipping away. So they're holding on to it as hard as, they, hard as they can. That's one part. The other part is many of the next generations couldn't care less about being Jewish or observantly religious. It doesn't matter if they're Sephardic Ashkenazi. They don't care about any of, the, any of the tradition anyway. So they're disappearing from the discussion. The other thing is those who are becoming more religiously observant are tending to follow Ashkenazic models, which bothers me significantly. In other words, you find Sephardic rabbis, very good Sephardic rabbis, they wear a big black hat, a big black coat, they look just like they came from Poland. And not just that they look like that, but they're learned that way, their, their thinking is that way. You have in Israel, uh, Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, of blessed memory, he started Shas. What is Shas? It's a so-called Sephardic party, but it, and it has differences from Agudat Yisrael, I'm not saying it doesn't, but all in all, the tone is very Haredi, very, very much not what Sephardic life historically has been. So more and more religiously sensitive Sephardic Jews are becoming more extreme, more narrow, more fundamentalist, which is, a, I consider, a big problem. On the other side, they're more and more drifting away altogether. And in the middle, there are people clinging on to the tradition without having a vision, why am I holding on to this tradition? What is it for? Where am, what do I want my kids or grandkids to get out of this? How am I going to attract other people into my orbit? Now, the Sephardic synagogues, as, as ethnic entities, I think are, are going to ultimately disappear. There's going to be, like Spanish and Portuguese synagogue. Most of the members are not Spanish or Portuguese at all. 
But the tradition, is, the tradition is meaningful, it's beautiful, it's aesthetic, it has a message, it has a philosophy, and people are attracted to that, not, not because of their ethnic uh, connection, but because it's appealing to them as human beings. That's the future of Sephardic life. So my feeling is that um, our Ladino tradition is valuable and deep and beautiful, because it can make all of us better human beings. Not just better Sephardic Jews, it can make us better human beings. And that's where my direction of my teaching is.